This is a production of Cornell University. Um, thank you for that. And thank you, Carlin, for inviting me here. This is an exciting place for me to be because I do work with a lot of uh, horticultural crops. So I'll get started by kind of laying out what I want to talk about today. Um, I kind of have like three big like introductory buckets that I think are really important before we get to what Breeding Insight is doing. So I want to talk first about the grand challenges and blockers that breeders feel in general, but specifically horticultural breeders. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the types of breeding programs we encounter in our, in our work. And then I want to lay a foundation for how germplasm banks can really or should really be leveraging breeding programs today. And then we'll end on what we're actually doing at Breeding Insight and a new initiative called BI OnRamp. So the well, first of the grand challenge really is adapting to climate change. And this is the elephant in the room for me because it is a huge issue. It's extremely complex and it's not something you can do in one talk or even one slide. So I'm going to do just start, start with an example that many people probably feel familiar with, and that's uh, the plant hardiness zones. So in 2000, the area of New York that we're in right now was solidly in a zone five. Ten years later, it was split between a five and a six. And by 2040, it's going to be completely in a six. So within your lifetime, these hardiness zones have shifted significantly. And climate change isn't just about the hardiness zones. We need to make sure that our breeders are equipped to breed for varieties that can tolerate longer growing seasons, flooding and or drought, sometimes within the same location, higher day and night temperatures, new diseases and pests that are coming up from the south, and also more weed pressure. The second grand challenge is improving product quality and storage. And this is really important in crops that are sold fresh as produce because they need to improve the post-harvest quality before uh, they're sold at market. So in apples and potatoes, um, the amount of marketable yield is impacted by how much bruising is sustained before these products are actually sold. So in this example, the uh, bruising has been reduced in both apple and potato through a transgene uh, compared to the uh, cultivated uh, non-transgenic uh, parental variety here. So if we can reduce bruising, we're gonna reduce waste and loss, and that will increase our shelf life and also increase the marketable yield, which is what the farmer is actually getting paid for. We also need to be considering breeding for improved nutritional content. So take, for example, vitamin A, all of the best plant-based sources for that are all horticultural crops. Another thing we need to be thinking about is labor costs. Horticultural crops are really defined by how much labor they take and are you know, typically thought of as extremely labor intensive. And that often can make a breeder or a grower turn away from using or growing specialty species because of that expense and time. But robotics, as shown in this example with lettuce here, are new varieties are coming up all the time from breeders as they start to adapt their varieties to machine harvesting or mechanical uh, manipulation. And they're also creating varieties that are better suited to mass uh, harvest. Horticultural crops, especially uh, anything that's eaten as fresh produce, are particularly vulnerable to pests, diseases, and weed pressure. So we, as a grower or a breeder, we want to minimize profit loss due to cosmetic defects and spotting. And that means that we end up using a lot of herbicides and pesticides on our crops. And that takes a toll not only on the, uh, the individual plants themselves, but on our environment. So by increasing in a, the ability of a crop, oops, excuse me, the crop's ability to resist pests and uh, diseases and uncompleted weeds on its own means we can apply less uh, herbicides or uh, pesticides and have a lower impact on the environment we're living in. And lastly, we all rely on a global food supply chain to get food from farms to supermarkets to our homes. And at the best of time, you probably never even think about this, but if this pandemic has probably shown you anything, is that our food supply chain is extremely fragile. And disruption of that food supply chain disproportionately affects populations that are already at risk for poverty and hunger. And is this uh, article from last month stated, 
An additional 137 million people face food insecurity as 2020 ended due to the pandemic. And two of the biggest reasons was the interrupted food supply chain and rising food costs. So how do plant breeders work to address these grand challenges? Well, they really got to start on something smaller. So a breeder's goal is to release, put your new trade of interest here, varieties sooner. And those goals around creating newer, better varieties for release they may even overlap each other. You may be working on several different uh, objectives in your breeding program. So it may be no chill blueberry or powdery mildew resistant grape, high bricks melons, longer shelf life or higher yielding. So in major crops, there are a lot of tools and technologies that work across hundreds of different breeding programs. And that technology has mostly come out of private research and also universities. And major crops have a lot in common with each other. Most of them are, or all of them are fully mechanized with low labor costs. They're annual crops that function as diploids. They are propagated through seed and have a lot of commercial breeding support behind it. And they're typically giving high yields and a dry harvest. So products are not being consumed as harvested. And the, the, if we look at horticultural crops, it's much different. So we'll take an example above here of tomato and below of grape. And if we think about how many of these boxes we can tick, we can only tick a subset of them. So they're both annual crops that are functional diploids and can be propagated through seed. And there is some commercial breeding that supports it. But if you work in a species that's not one of these, how many boxes can you actually tick off? And that's important because tech transfer by trickle-down agronomics is not going to work. For horticultural crops, the number and the, the diversity of crops and the diversity of challenges is too disparate for one solution to fit. And we talk a little bit about um, all breeders have challenges, but let's talk specifically about what additional challenges horticultural breeders may be feeling. So our breeder, goal is to get to newer and better varieties faster. What's preventing that from happening? Well, in the logistical category, you're often dealing with small budgets, typically $200,000 uh, annually or less. You're often working with a small or temporary workforce. Uh, breeders are retiring at a high rate right now. Uh, and this labor intensive management, um, there's aging facilities and uh, IP and MTA restrictions uh, for actually makes it much more difficult for breeders to share even from different universities. There's also technical blockers. Um, there may be historical program data for 50 years um, in a breeding program, but most of it isn't digitized. So it's not accessible to the breeder to use. And it's also very difficult if you have a very small program to adopt new technologies. Where do you start and how do you know what technology is really gonna be long lasting and effective in your program? And how much is it going to cost to maintain that? Environment, we've talked a little bit about all of the challenges, but if you're a horticultural breeder, how do you make decisions today for the environment five to 10 years from now when we've just seen it's changing so rapidly, we're almost at a point where we cannot predict it. And what decisions or what data do you need to make that decision? And lastly, biological. A lot of our horticultural crops have complex genomes or are high polyploid. Some of them are, are uh, non-annual life cycle, so biennial or perennial, may have self incompatibility, may have long time to uh, long juvenile periods that require you know, 10 years to get to flowering. So this affects all, all of these together can hold a program back and in many cases needlessly. So next I wanna talk briefly about the types of breeding programs that we see. And before I get into that, I wanna talk about the breeder's eye. Um, this is really important because to date, most of the progress done in breeding, no matter what species you've looked at, was done through phenotypic selection. And that's true for dogs as much as it is for corn or tomatoes. And the reason why is it's really easy. You can do it in your backyard. You don't need any specialized equipment. But what, what is really difficult is that it takes years to perfect. You can do it, but to be a really good phenotypic selection breeder, it takes 20 to 25 years to really know your germplasm well enough to do this. So 
for most horticultural crops, breeder knowledge is really much more important than the, the, the genetics in their decision making process. So they're, they're looking at the overall architecture of the plant and the products coming off the plant, and they're making uh, decisions based on their own evaluation. So it relies on high numbers and subjective evaluations. The next step up would be marker assisted selection, where breeders' knowledge is being supplemented with some genetic information. And this requires that you have some understanding of the markers associated with the trait of interest. And it's usually used for disease resistance loci or other things of Mendelian uh, control. And then the pinnacle of the mountain really is genomic selection, where the breeder's knowledge isn't nearly as important as what the genetics can predict can be possible. So in this case, you're using high quality phenotype data, lots of genotypic data on your individuals, and you're making selection decisions before you can even see your phenotypes uh, expressed in those plants. And this is likely to be a really huge benefit for crops that have a very long generation time, because if you can do speed breeding and uh, progress your, um, uh, your generations forward faster than you can phenotype them, you can make more progress more quickly. And while it looks really simple the way I've laid it out here, there are real challenges and barriers to entry that keep breeders from moving up this mountain. And that could be the culmination of all the logistical, technical, biological challenges. And that really can hold a program back and make them feel like there's no way I can get to this point. And a lot of our phenotypic breeders ask me, why do I need genomics? Why should I do this? So my answer to them is that sequencing technology is accessible and affordable for all species. You have a lot of information to collect and assimilate and act upon in short windows of time. And you've got fixed constraints. You don't have infinite money or time. And you don't get to see if you were right until it's too late to change course. So by supplementing their eye with genomic data and analytics and prediction models, we can start freeing breeders from some of this grunt work and reduce the uncertainty in their programs. So they can get back to doing more breeding. So this is the, the last part of my introduction. I really wanna kind of focus a little bit about the important role that our germplasm banks should be playing in our breeding programs. So our gene banks are places where we keep our public elites, our obsolete cultivars, land races, and crop wild relatives. And it's a public resource. And anybody can request uh, seeds or uh, cuttings from the ger germplasm bank, whether you're a breeder or at a university or not. And we also know that the breeder's goal is to really release new and improved cultivars and varieties. But if you stay within your breeding program and you never keep a closed system, you're really reducing the amount of new traits and alleles you can be bringing into your program that may be the insurance you need to be combating the future uh, challenges is coming up, whether it's climate change or new pests. So the way this happens is that through the process of discovery breeding, or also called pre-breeding, um, is taking materials that are unadapted or more wild, and eventually integrating them in using those native traits in the breeding program. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the original library model of germplasm banks. So this is the 80 White Library at Cornell. It's a classic library. It's gorgeous looking. It's very old fashioned, Harry Potter-ish, you know. Um, and so what we typically think of is like the pinnacle of our library, right? Even though there's probably not any digital stuff in here at all. Um, and then we have the Simit Active Maze Germplasm Collection and the former curator is sitting right in the audience today. <laughs> so, um, and she gave a great uh, example of how they're uh, making some changes at CIMIT and doing some new research, but I, that's getting a little bit ahead of myself. But the original model is to safely and securely store resources in perpetuity, repair and replace, or in the case of accessions, regenerate the resource units, house rare materials, and expose the contents therein for improved public access, right? That's pretty simple. I think everybody would kind of agree that that's the function of these libraries. And in the US, we're very lucky to have the USDA NPGS system. Um, and it's a series of, of uh, different kinds of uh, germplasm banks that are um, sometimes seed banks, or in the case of animals, it's actually cryostorage. 
uh, tissue culture banks and living repository repositories, such as up in Geneva, the apple and the grape collections there. Globally, you can access even more uh, accessions and diverse materials if you're going through Green Global. And this is all free to be distributed. So when we think about how we've gotten to this point where we're having to go back to our germplasm banks, it's important to remember that humans have migrated all over the planet and we take what we like with us, okay? And that has created a bunch of different bottlenecks and germplasm sharing across the, across the globe. And so coming back to this very famous diagram from um, Tanksley McCooch in Science 1997, we've basically recapitulated this process over and over and over again for all of the species that we breed for. And this is borne out in the molecular evidence. And I'm just gonna give two examples. The first is a tomato, uh, it's about 2000 SNPs. All of the cultivated tomatoes are in this band here on this PCA or MDS plot. And you can see that there's some um, pluses, I think they're pluses or Xs. Um, so there's some other uh, accessions that show in the total diversity of crossable species, the cultivated tomato is occupying a very narrow slice of that diversity. And the same is true for upland cotton or uh, Cipium hirsutum. And so here's the uh, improved varieties in the uh, diamond shape here. And then the wild hirsutum, the land races, is all in this green. So there's a lot of diversity out there, and I will be the first to admit not all of it is stuff you want in your domesticated vines. But there's a lot of stuff that we've gotten rid of because phenotypic selections like taking a chainsaw to the turkey. It's not precise. It is taking out large swaths of your genome, okay? So I revisited this paper in preparation for this talk. And I kind of wanted to reevaluate our underutilized genetic resources. And as I was going through the paper again, um, which I read as a graduate student, um, I pulled out a couple of quotes that I thought I'd share with you today. The first is the tools of genome research may finally unleash the genetic potential of our wild and cultivated germplasm. And then the second is until now, remember, this is 1997. We have been only modestly successful in utilizing these resources for plant improvement, but that's still true today. And why is that? Why are we not doing a better job at tapping our genetic resources in those germplasm banks for benefit in our breeding programs? Well, it's not easy, right? We all kind of understand this. If you have a germplasm bank and you've got a native trait of interest that you're uh, looking to capture, and let's say it's a few genes, major effects, or it's a Mendelian trait. Mark-assisted backcross or Mars, or Mars approach has been actually pretty successful in capturing those traits and bringing them into elite cultivars. However, most of the traits we care about are quantitative. They don't fall into this Mendelian pattern. They have many genes, small effects. And that means that this marker-assisted backcross or Mars um, migration into elite material it just isn't effective. It's just too slow. Even though it's cheap to do, it's too slow and it's not effective. And it's, it's really caused a lot of heartbreak and very few success stories. The next is um, that the time and effort it takes to do pre-breeding has to be a, an, an effort that you put forward for that exact purpose. And the way I mean that is that most mid to large size agricultural seed companies employ discovery breeders or pre-breeders in their program. And they do not produce varieties. They produce much different output. Their job is to identify desirable new traits from exotic germplasm, integrate desirable traits into germplasm using markers, adapt material to the local environment. Sometimes it's an elite that just doesn't work as well in the environment that they're in and broaden and maintain genetic diversity within their institution's program. So pre-breeders are actually producing new parents that then go into line variety cultivar breeder uh, programs. And one of the ways to do this is that they have the money and the time to do genomic selection plus bridging. So they're able to use markers and that they are testing on wild material, do crosses within wild material, to try to stack large quantities of alleles and then use a, an elite that can bridge into the program 
And by the time you get here, the donor is only at one quarter a percentage of the genome. And then it can enter into a breeding cycle from the breeder. But by then, a lot of the big things of uh, adaptability, flowering time, uh, plant architecture have been weeded out, no pun intended, uh, weeded out of the, um, the entering lines from bridging. So when I think about what do we do to try to assess pre-breeding needs right now, um, and Green Global is a great place to start because as, as a minimal need, if you were a breeder and you wanted to tap into your genomic, re your germplasm resources for doing some pre-breeding, you need to be able to search that gene germplasm and get lots of different kinds of data, the passport data, genetic data, if there's maps, that would be great, phenotypic QTL data, plant characteristics, photographs, published results, and how do I order the seed, right? And it's not enough just to have that, you need to export this. You need to bring all this information into your program for Providence and for correcting any errors that you might find if the seed lot's messed up. And Green Global's already doing a great job with most of this stuff. And these other two, the gen genetic data, including maps and phenotypic QTL data is already in discussion on how they're going to build in support and space in Green Global for these types of activities. So my last slide on this section is really asking you a question. Is it time for an updated gene bank model? Um, in 2003, uh, 13, the Pew research study asked people about their brick and mortar libraries. What do you want from your brick and mortar libraries? Well, everybody wanted everything that was in the old model. Plus they wanted a bunch of new stuff that was not anticipated. So my question to you is what new resources or services would you ask of your species germplasm bank? What new mandates or roles should they be playing in the propagation and migration of native traits into breeding programs? Okay, that's it for the intro. Um, now we'll get into some fun stuff talking about breeding insight and also uh, BI online. And as Jean-Luc mentioned, our goal at Breeding Insight really is to transform breeding by enabling the implementation of genomic insight and selection as part of routine breeding, specialty breeding programs all across the USDA ARS system. So as a breeder, I need to make progress in my program. And there's a couple of things I really need. I need to be able to manage my program. I need to know who's doing what work in my program, what locations they're in, what traits I have. Um, you know, I need to be able to keep all my data in a central location that's not Excel. I need to be able to go out to the field and collect data. I need to make sure that data gets back into my program safely and securely. And then I'm going to manage my samples. Some samples are going for DNA extraction. Others might be going for express berry testing. And I want access to my germplasm banks. I know this is where I'm going to get my new alleles for disease resistance. I need to get access to that. And I need to store and collect my genetic data and put it someplace where I can find it easily. And then I need to bring my data together to run genomic analysis. And I got to make decisions. So I want something that helps me make those decisions and then helps me write my annual report when I don't want to have to re-say the same thing each time. I want to be able to generate that. So all breeders are operating on a 12-month calendar cycle. It's the nature of our work. Um, it's also the nature of the species that live in our environment. And they all need um, about the same things that maybe the timing is different, but they need it in about the same order. So every breeding program is managing stocks and pedigrees, performing crosses, designing and managing trials, and then managing nurseries or wherever else they're growing these. They also need to determine their genotypes, capture phenotypes that might be on pen and paper, could be with a voice recorder or a tablet. They need to evaluate both their genotypes and their phenotypes, and then they got to make their decisions. So it could be selection, but it also could be culling decisions as well and make the reports. And so this is the digital ecosystem where a breeder is living. These are all these, the, the action points that they have to create every year within their program again and again. And we're at the center here trying to create a unified platform or a unified digital ecosystem where our breeders can operate and make all of their decisions in a central location. And while I'm showing this for plants, it doesn't look that different for animals, at least in the terms of uh, aquaculture. 
or even in the terms of uh, bumblebee. It's basically the same processes. So this allows us to build economy of scale by generalizing everything we can and only putting the species specific uh, needs at the end of our uh, program development. Okay, so I've convinced you you need software. Where are you gonna start? You got a lot of options here. Some of them are no cost, some of them are low cost, but how do you know where to start? How do you know what's right for you on this board given your species? And this is one of the reasons that Breeding Insight was created. So right now we work with six uh, ARS specialty groups. I'm gonna ignore the non-horticultural crops for today and the non-animals as well. And we work with them really closely as a, as a partner in their program. And we help them, we build their genotyping platforms and find them their providers. We help them manage their phenotypic data and adopt new tools like Fieldbook. And we act as a breeding consultation and support system. When they have a problem with Fieldbook, they know who to call. They call us and we have to fix it. And we deliver software considering what's publicly available in the, in the market right now, um, what functionality our breeders need to address their breeder specified use cases. If you're working in a perennial, you might need to be able to manage your rootstocks, not necessary in a fish uh, program. And we also need to make sure that anything that we're connecting has a communication pipeline behind it. It can talk from one program to another. And we'll talk about a little bit more about how we do that in coming slides. And then we lay on top of that, the species specific user interface that's intuitive for breeders. So our initial platform starts with a breeding management program called BreedBase. And this was developed by Lucas Mueller's group up at BTI. And we're also uh, working with the uh, Fieldbook app from the PhenoApp suite. Uh, we're looking at using Gigwa for our genetic data management. And eventually we wanna hook up with Green Global. And the way we're making uh, the different pieces of software, which all have their own development groups, they all have their own uh, objectives. We're connecting them using um, what's called BRAPI, which is the breeding API. And if you're not familiar, I'm just going to spend like a half a minute talking about it. Um, BRAPI is short for Breeding Application Programming Interface. And it's a, just a protocol for getting different software to talk to each other quickly and make sure they speak the same language. And as a user, you should never have to see it or know anything specific about it. The best things are ones you don't have to think about. But before BRAPI, if someone was using BreedBase and Fieldbook, they'd have to um, export files out of BreedBase, then import it into the tablet for Fieldbook, then take the data, send it back out, and put it back in. That's four steps where a human has to be interacting, okay? But if you're using BRAPI, you're basically having database talk to database. And so it's under the covers, it's not seen, and it's nothing the user really has to worry about. And there's, um, so in terms of uh, integrating the software, the first integration we worked on is getting BreedBase and Fieldbook to connect to each other through BRAPI without needing the manual file transfer. And it's fairly simple. You can load a field directly from BreedBase onto the tablet. You can then go out and collect your phenotypes. And then when you export it back to BreedBase, you get a summary of what you've exported. So you get a little bit of a, a QC step there that tells you you know, you got through this many uh, evaluations today. And anybody is welcome to use that. Um, and it's available in the current field book and all the way back to 4.1. So in terms of breed base, it has a lot of functionality, but our breeders find it very difficult to navigate. It's the interface is not intuitive for them and it's not really set up for a, a breeding program's 12 month calendar cycle. So we're using a workflow-based approach to lower that barrier to entry and improve the user experience while you know, basically taking advantage of all of the great breed-based functionality below. So I have a couple of screenshots to show you of our software. Um, for our trait management, you can uh, look at your traits and get uh, trait details right in a pop-up window. You can add new traits very simply here. So if you wanna test out a new trait for you know, a new you know, you're seeing rust come up in your population and you want to give a, do a couple different ways of testing that to see which is heritable, you can set that up right here. You can also manage your program, your locations, which locations are, have which trials. 
um, manage your users, add users, and then get clear notification when things are have been completed and, and made changes to the database. And rather than asking people to put all of their data into a template that the computer can understand, we're asking the computer to understand what the data is. And so in this case, you have your output file from whatever phenotypic data you have. You create a mapping using the BRAPI fields, and then you just import your file directly. You do not need to convert your file to an importable format. The computer will do that for you. So the nice thing about using BRAPI as our standard and as our, our data model is that it gives us a lot of flexibility because ReadBase is BRAPI compliant, and so is PhenoApps and Gigwa, and Green Global's on its way to being BRAPI compliant. So that means if we have a new breeder comes in and they work on Peach, and they say, but I use the GDR, I use the genome database for rosacea. I don't want to change my database model just because I'm, I'm coming into Breeding Insight. Well, GDR is on its way to being BRAPI compliant as well. So we don't have to have them change it. They can still use their database of choice because we can connect to anything else through BRAPI. It's an incredibly powerful tool that also extends to the breeding management software that was put out by uh, integrated breeding platform. So this really allows our sol technology solutions to be used much more broadly than just the users that we're serving today. But we do a lot more than just work with software. Um, we work with, we build genetic marker sets. Um, two of our application or our programs already had um, markers available, either 2K or 50K SNPs. But we did help fund uh, extensive genotyping in those programs. And in the case of Graves, we genotyped over 7,000 vines in the public repository. We've also created marker sets for alfalfa, blueberry, and salmon within BI. And we're in the process of developing markers for sweet potato and an endemic weevil that is uh, predating, uh, predates on the sweet potato. So great, once you have markers, that's great, but you still need to have a vendor who's gonna keep costs down for you. You have a small program, you can't afford to be spending you know, $30,000 on genotyping. So we worked with the, the Excellence in Breeding Platforms Module 3 to um, feed into their uh, vendor pipeline, which starts with Intertech for DNA extraction and uses the diversity array technologies in Australia for genotyping. And by working with them, right now we're at a cost point of between $10 or $11, depending on how many samples. And that includes DNA extraction. So that's a huge benefit to our breeders. Um, and we're hoping that with more volume coming into these providers, we'll be able to call, get that cost to come down even further. So you've got markers, you've got a vendor. Oh, my genome's too big. I can't use markers. Like, it's just too complicated. I don't know how to deal with it. Well, this is, this is a real issue when you're dealing with high polypoidy or auto polypoids, and we have those in our program. So um, in collaboration with Marcella Molinari, we've been working with our tetraploid blueberry, and I wanted to share um, some preliminary data from uh, our, our work with him. So this is a preliminary map not using haplotypes. The data sets that we are getting actually produce 54 base pair amplicons. So there's a target SNP and then there's off target SNPs that we see. So we get a lot of haplotypes per locus. So while we say 3000 markers, we're actually saying 3000 loci. So we can get upwards of 8,000 markers coming out of this system. So it's kind of a cross between SNP markers and SSRs where you're not dealing in a binary situation. And this has allowed us to actually separate by subgenome. So here's our genetic map on two, 200 Draper by Jewel uh, biparental uh, F1s. And one thing that's been really exciting is that we can now look at the genetic map distance in comparison to the genomic map distance. And I'm gonna highlight some regions where we genetically are not seeing a lot of separation, but we are in the genomic space because those are the centromeres. So we have enough uh, coverage here to actually identify where our recombination space is. And that's extremely important if you're migrating alleles and monitoring those alleles through, through breeding is to be able to track how much you're moving in and how big the, the, the area around the trait of interest is in drag. We're also helping integrate phenomics tools in the field. 
Um, there's a handheld app, as I mentioned, field book that's being used in vineyards and orchards and also in fields uh, to collect data on um, vines and plots and trials. And this is an Android tablet app. Again, you have go out to the field with your traits preloaded and your field preloaded. You can collect photographs right on it. There's also free text notes and it has a barcode scanner. So it kind of has everything you need once you've set it up in your field. And we're also testing a hands-free voice to text option um, with Ag Voice. And this take, it just needs a smartphone or a tablet, a headset and a Bluetooth ring. And you just touch the ring when you want to turn on the, the voice and you say your trait and value and then turn it off and it collects it and spits it out in Excel. We're also integrating phenomic tools in the lab. So here's an example from Sweet Potato. We're doing 3D imaging and with the plant spec, uh, plant eye, plant, phenol specs plant eye. And he's using this specifically because he wants to detect the percentage of insect damage on the tubers that he's harvesting. But in addition to doing this, he can get a bunch of other phenotypes as well. Length, width, volume, area, tuber grade and counts, all within one image. We're also um, using fruit quality testing in Blueberry uh, using penetrometers. So this is an instrument that outputs an Excel file for every accession you have. 30 berries uh, go into the tray. You can get fruit firmness, diameter, weight, and berry scar size, all from uh, a really fast measurement. And then we're also doing juice testing in Blueberry on Express Juice for a number of different uh, components in that juice. And uh, we've also had some of our breeders say, I need to fix, put some barcodes on my locations or fixed objects. And this is really important if you're working in salmon where you have tanks of in fish and each tank is a family and they move as they graduate from, from one size of fish to the next size fish, they have to be moved physically. So by affixing a, a label, we could actually label tanks with a very cheap and easy way to collect animal welfare data, which I'm not gonna talk about today because you guys are horticulture people, but it's really important to keep track of your animals when you're working with an animal breeding program. So here's a simple method that uh, we developed to design the labels in field book or in breed base, laminate the page, cut and trim those labels, get a half a coin Velcro sticker set and just put the stickers right on the back and you can move them around and they're waterproof and you can use this to label storage bins for harvest or um, storage shelves in rooms, or greenhouses and benches within, and also instruments and equipment. So if you have more than one type of equipment, you can actually say which machine is this coming off. And this whole total cost was a hundred bucks. So this is a really affordable way for someone who doesn't have a lot of money or doesn't can't buy a Brady printer can start using uh, barcodes in their program. So right now we're just finishing our pilot phase. And what that really means is that um, our breeding inside core is at Ithaca and we work across three um, buckets of, group of uh, species. So we have specialty crops. We're only working with three out of approximately 50 the USDA breeds for. Specialty animals, we're only working with two out of the approximately 15. And for re natural resources, just one out of approximately 30. And we, uh, work very closely with the national program, the Office of National Programs and Tim Reinhardt is our, our liaison for that. And this is the current model for our, our pilot. But we are now moving out of the pilot into our next stage, which would be one breeding insight. And the way this works is that this remains the same, but now we can distribute breeding insight coordinators nationally by using a new program called BI OnRamp. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about that. So BI OnRamp was originally created to be an ARS Jumpstart Readiness Program, but it's actually expanded a little bit beyond that. So in terms of who it's for, it's for any non-specialty crop or animal breeders that want to take on new technology, but um, don't qualify because they're not specialty crops. But it also serves specialty crop and animal breeders that want or need a more extended transition. If they're not ready to just jump in and start making markers and using technology, this is a great way for them to get their program ready to go. And it takes a one to two year commitment. And for this second category, they would come into Breeding Insight and have the rest of the uh, services filled out. And together with BI and BI OnRamp, 
we can help more breeders because we have separate species and we work very closely with each other. We share the same project management solutions. We're on calls with each other. Uh, we talk every week and we have a lot of the same space that we're working in. Um, similar use cases and data curation, creating how to's for people. This is um, an area where we don't need to repeat the same work. We can share across both programs. And as I mentioned, we're coming into our second phase and we've got our new species coming in for tree fruits and nuts. It's cranberry, pecan and strawberry. Our animal foraging field will be oat and honeybee. And for vegetables, it'll be cucumber and lettuce. And BI on ramp is picking up citrus, sugarcane, soybean, and cotton. So these two obviously are not specialty crops, so they would not fall under our model, but sugarcane and citrus could. So we are, offer a lot of different services, and some of the services have to come in order, and we work with our breeders to understand that. But the priorities and needs are really determined by the breeder. We don't tell them so much as guide them to help them build the scope that they are comfortable with. And the central model here is that, you know, technology coming out of basic research, and it should just kind of trickle down to plant and animal breeders. But Breeding Insights really here as a conduit to help facilitate that transfer from uh, basic science to applied science. And we work with our breeders to make sure we have solutions that really do fit for them long term, not just today and or you know this week in a testing phase. And before I go, I want to leave you with one quote. <laughs> um, and this is from Liberty High Bailey. I love this quote. Um, it's, is there any progress in horticulture? If not, it's dead. It's uninspiring. We cannot live in the past good as it is. We must draw our inspiration from the future. And I think that is exactly what we need to be doing with our horticultural crops. We can ask more of them than we do. And with that, I'll take any questions. Are there any questions? Oh, Wojtek. So Marina, I, uh, you used the word uh, long term. And when I was thinking that listening to you, I was, uh, my question was, so this is a USDA initiative. Like what is the long term plan for that? I mean, like to be honest, if I was uh, a breeder, my thought would be, okay, well, sure, I get, can uh, get invested into that. And it's not just a question of money. It's also yeah, yeah. a question of like, maybe adapting, like modifying a breeding program to, to fit it better. And then, uh, you know, after the, I don't know, two, three years, uh, the support is gone. And 10 years from now, I have an obsolete product. So I'm back to square one, way better. Exactly. No, we hear that a lot. In fact, we've gotten a, several of them that are like, I'm good where I am. I don't want your help. And, you know, we, we work around them. But the ARS has really done a lot at the area and uh, research level to make breeding insight a priority that all the areas are putting into their five year plan. So the ARS is just is making investments into ARS outside of what breeding insight is doing here. They're making uh, it a priority in research groups. And so the long term model hasn't been decided and it's above my pay grade anyways, but I know that um, for now, what I keep telling them is that what we are teaching you to do is how to do it for yourself. You, if you start using genotypes in your program routinely, you'll be able to know exactly how much to budget for that, how much to put in. And with a, and a user interface that's very breeder friendly, we should only have to be helping out with like major problems or if there's a new update that kind of breaks something important. But the idea is to, to help them get on the bike and then let them ride the bike themselves. Well, but you have to provide the parts for, you know, if you buy the bike, you want the manufacturer yeah. to be around to, to buy spare parts. Right. Well, I hope we'll be around <laughs> to, to provide spare parts for, for a long time. So, so I guess the answer to my question is the uh, USGA isn't working on it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe Jean-Luc has more information than I do. <laughs> But I would disagree with your model, your four-year model, because look at green global, for instance. That spans a lot of years, a lot of administrations, and it's a huge game changer now for, for everybody. For everybody who's, who's, uh, has 
Some banks and others. So. No, I mean, I, you're not disagreeing with me. Like, I, I, I'm not negative. I say to, to, for that to have impact, it, it has to be more than just one job. Yeah. Oh, so, for sure. Yeah. I guess that, that's, that was my, the point of my question. In case. Yeah. And I don't have an answer yet that would satisfy your question. The answer is it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. <laughs> but that is an answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious about uh, adapting new phenomics pipelines into the, the existing system. Is that pretty involved, or can you, like, as long as the phenomics pipeline has an output file, can easily be adapted? If if you're working with instrument data that has an output file, that's super easy. Cool. Um, if you're working with something where you haven't automated it, like, let's say you're taking pictures of Vine architecture and then having to kind of draw and, and simplify the picture down to extract phenotypes. If you don't have that automated, it takes a long time to do it. Um, it's, it's cheap, but it's labor intensive. But as soon as you can get, if you can automate that process like an image J and then pull that information out, then any of that can be easily um, imported into the uh, breed base, or we can find a way for Brappy to do it directly. Did you have a question? Yeah, so is this platform like just available to like the species you talked about or if like other people are interested in using it, is it like available for them to use? That's a fantastic question. So right now it's the funding comes from ARS for ARS. So we focus on that. But um, if there are public breeders that work closely with our ARS breeders, they benefit because the breeders told us I can't run my program without NC State doing the field trials. So in that case, we'd support them as well. But once it's done, I mean, it's available. Anybody can use it right now. I should have showed my, my, my last slide with my acknowledgments. Um, there is a GitHub site, so anybody can download and set this up for themselves. It's in a Docker. Um, it, should have, it should be easy to deploy with, you know, some, with some help. But, <laughs> um, but you, could, you could find um, you, other people are absolutely welcome to use it because it's all free software. I'm going to get this thing off here so people can. Is that maybe time for one quick more question? Another second question. Yeah. There's no one. So what are you also thinking about, like, like uh, helping? So from time to time, like, the kind of major developments and in, in, like, potential breeding, developing new breeding programs, like, let's say, deployed potato, mm -hmm. where the barrier to entry for, for, for a breeder is huge. Is that something that you also thinking in, in involving in your like overall scope of interest? I think so. I mean, if, uh, if we start working with potato and they say, well, we want to run, we, we run a tetraploid breeding program, but we also want to start setting up a diploid breeding program, we would help them with that. We would treat those as separate programs that maybe one is considered almost like a pre-breeding program. Because eventually, to be commercialized, you'd still have to be tetraploid. So we could probably set up something very simple, and it wouldn't take a lot more work for us to help them with that. I mean, like, it, it would be a, like, you would have to start developing resources, some resources from scratch, right? They don't... Some, but since most of the, re I mean, there's already a marker panel for tetraploid potato that works exactly like our panel. And it's able to work with auto polyploids, which... We'll see if it works with hexaploids, but it's so far for tetraploids, it looks easy. So, so diploids would be easy. It's just that um, when you're taking a diploid and then extracting or doing genomic selection to try to anticipate what it's going to look like as it is a tetraploid, that's, you're, you're discounting the fact that there could be somatic mutations there too. And that's, that's really why a lot of people don't do that is because there's too much unknown and they can't control for it. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.